Welcome to Waiting on the Trade, a comics book club for people who can't keep up with monthly comics. I'm Matt Ledger. I'm Patrick Fitzgerald Fleck. And I'm Callum Smith. This month, we're talking about Usagi Yojimbo Grasscutter, the celebrated long form epic that stars Stan Sakai's wandering rabbit samurai, Usagi Yojimbo. In case you need a refresher, Grasscutter is the culmination of 11 years of Usagi Yojimbo comics, tying many pre-existing story threads together within a struggle for the titular Grasscutter, an epic sort of legend. The secret conspiracy of eight believe that if they are able to retrieve Grasscutter, they can restore the Japanese emperor to his throne. Of course, things don't go smoothly as Usagi ends up retrieving the sword, but to keep it, he must hold off both the conspiracy's foot soldiers and the mysterious demon samurai known as G. J? J. 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 <laughs> <laughs> all right we did it good podcast you guys yes <laughs> i told you guys this at discord but like this was the hardest story summary i've had to write for one of these podcast episodes i think yeah because i think yeah. this might be the longest story we've read for the podcast so far oh, yeah that's interesting. and there's a lot going on as well yeah like this is only the main through line this is yeah, disregarding yeah. like eight other characters in the yeah. book <laughs> plus the prologues which it's... we'll talk about <laughs> Like to get to get the summary to a five sentence summary, mm. I had to cut three quarters of the book's content, and it's still the <laughs> longest summary we've written. <laughs> so, but anyways, before we get into that, Cal, welcome back to the podcast. Hello. Uh, yes, thank you very much for having me back. Uh, I am massively excited uh, to talk about this book. Uh, I was just throwing my hands in the air as I said that, but I continue to forget that podcasting is an audio medium isn't it so um <laughs> we just want everyone to kind of like think of that um elmo on a cake with the flames behind him meme right yes. kind of like picturing yeah. that yeah, yeah 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 good put that in the show notes please <laughs> <laughs> well the show notes don't have links in them right now because we're trying out this new condensed format so mm. <laughs> we'll see how we go okay. Okay. i've been lazy okay <laughs> <laughs> it makes it so we get two of these out a month, man. <laughs> yeah, so things are going well in the future today, it sounds like, from our, our pre-recording discussion. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, everybody's legs are very tired from doing a long run in the morning in the future, so you've, you've got that to look forward to. That's, that's the main defining feature of the day. So, uh, Cal, I told you we're doing kind of the, the condensed version of waiting on the trade still. We're trying it out where each of us brings two discussion questions um, mm -hmm. that we want to talk about related to the story. Mm -hmm. Before we do that, I want to make sure to ask you, what made you want to talk about Grasscutter? Mm, okay, yeah. So this is going to be a long answer, I think. Yes. Um, and... Pat, Pat, get ready. <laughs> what prologues do we have? I just want to be prepared. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I think so. There's a number of different reasons uh, that uh, I ended up picking this because it, it was quite a difficult decision. There were lots of different, or th there's a few different books that I was, I was particularly excited to have the opportunity to talk about. But uh, I ended up going for Grasscutter for a number of different reasons. One of them, I think, is I think any any opportunity that I have to sort of talk about uh, Usagi Ujembo is one worth taking because i think it is genuinely like one of the most like remarkable uh sort of comic series that i've ever come across and uh although it's you know it it, it would be inaccurate to describe it as a you know sort of like a, a hidden gem or anything because i think it is incredibly well established it's been sort of running now uh in various different forms since 1984 uh which is absolutely bananas with exactly the same creative team uh so well, creative team it's just one person that does creator, everything right? uh, yeah. <laughs> yes yeah the same same the same creator for like for that entire time and it's just consistent i don't I, and consistently great uh, as well i think and i think that that is just really remarkable particularly in western comics as well i think that that is incredibly unusual and i think it's just uh, i think it's a, a series as a whole uh, that really deserves to be sort of properly celebrated because uh, I think it does all kinds of things that you just don't see elsewhere in uh, certainly again certainly in Western comics and I think that uh, Grasscutter as a particular story within uh, Usagi Ojembo is a really interesting one to look at I think when when I picked this it was just before I sort of reread it which um, meant that when I did reread it I was struck by <laughs> by the extent to which it is the culmination of about sort of 10 years worth of story at that point 
Um, and so I'm going to be very interested to hear what that is like coming in. If you haven't, uh, uh, as I did, sort of like read everything preceding up to that point, read, reading about sort of, I don't know, sort of like 15 years worth of comics or like, sorry, yeah, well, depend, depending on how where you start the count, sort of 12 or 15 years worth of comics uh, up until this point, and like a huge amount of that is like drawn together in this story. But uh, it's it was the first um, Sagio Jumbo story to win an Eisner Award, and I think it is so sort of, sort of broadly recognised as like one of the most, I don't know, sort of like exciting, um, I don't know, sort of, sort of inventive um, and sort of like format pushing stories it, like to that point in the run as well. So I thought it was an interesting one to pick, but it is just a series in general that I am just massively excited to think about and then to talk about as well. Um, so that's that's why I picked Grass Cutter. So you called it, or almost called it a hidden gem. And to me that reminded me of the fact that like this was one of those books that wizard magazine was always like hey you stupid superhero comic only reader why aren't you reading this like every other month i swear to god they're like you should be reading your saki yojimbo so like that's kind of um i have read a little bit of the beginning stuff because i found mm -hmm. it actually at an airbnb we stayed at once <laughs> really? so that was, yeah like they had like the first few volumes of it so i read i think one i don't know if i got through all those while we were there i got through at least a couple Mm -hmm. um but then like just in wizard magazine like talking around it for years mm -hmm. i'd have cursory knowledge of like oh yeah that's g oh yeah that's jen oh yeah that's so, yeah. like that'll that'll definitely inform my answer for the the first question which i think <laughs> prologue to that because this is a book about prologue <laughs> in the beginning pat, yeah. pat do you have any experience with usagi before this or are you just picking it up cold um, I had heard of it for sure. I think the only uh, actual contact I've had with Usagi is through Teenage Mutant Ninja the Turtles. Turtles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Should, should we talk about that as well? Because I think I think it is interesting. Um, yeah, we definitely well, should. I yeah. originally thought it was a part. Oh, he's just a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle character. That's cool. Mm. I was wrong. I actually thought the same thing before I started stumbling upon all those wizard magazines. Like, hey, you should be reading this sections. Like. Because he was so attached to the turtles for a little bit there, at least in the mind of like '90s American children. Well, as a kid, you like you keep hearing, okay, these cartoon turtles are nice, but there's a really cool comic book they're based on. It's like, oh, okay, so that's probably where the ninja, where the, guy where the samurai from, yeah, rap right? is from like, too. So. No, it turns out it's his own thing. I don't, like, I actually am now like, how did that happen? We might have to have real show notes for this episode because now I'm going to dig into that. Yeah, I, I'm. Oh, I've, I've suddenly got some insight into it. So that's so in the kind of mid '80s in uh, in America, there was quite a big boom in just sort of like general anthropomorphic animal uh, comic character, like well, co comics in general. So there was like a number of different titles that were um, like just focused entirely on that, um, and both Usagi Ojumbo and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles sort of span out of that same boom, uh, like uh, basically at the same kind of time as well. And uh, Stan Sakai, uh, the creator um, of Usagi Ojumbo and the creators of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, who's Kevin... Uh, yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> gotcha. and I think there's, 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 there's another guy as well, right? I think I think there's, there's two. Yes, Peter, yeah. Peter or something? Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> well... The other, the other person. Um, anyway, Peter Laird. Yeah, they they were on sort of like good terms um, and sort of friendly, and so there was there's quite a lot of crossover comics that were done in the sort of like late late eighties, early nineties, um, uh, with um, either Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles turning up in Usagi Ojumbo comics, or yeah, vice versa. Um, and uh, then I think that that then led to Usagi appearing in uh basically uh, almost every iteration of teenage mutant ninja turtles sort of cartoons sort of going forward uh, as well so he, i think it's, it's probably uh the place where a huge amount of people get their first exposure to him uh that wasn't the case for me uh because i didn't really get that much exposure to teenage mutant ninja turtles as a child um but i think maybe, maybe similarly to matt um well, or in a parallel to that, I think I, I first started hearing about Isagio Jumbo on uh, Comics Alliance, uh, which was a good comics uh, sort of like journalism criticism website that ran in sort of like the mid 2010s or like early 2010s to mid 2010s, and they were always sort of banging the drum for it. 
Um, and so I picked up the first uh, sort of collection of Dark Horse, um, of like the Dark Horse comics era of uh, Usagi Ojimbo when they were publishing it. And the first sort of like story in their first collection of that is a crossover between Usagi and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which was, which is quite a weird, jarring way to start. Start, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, But uh, like, um, anyway, yeah, they've they've got some very closely intertwined uh, sort of like creative histories. And yeah, uh, I think that seems to be likely uh, to be the case going forward, I think as well. He's still been cropping up in some of the very recent sort of like CG uh, animated Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles stuff. Yeah, That's so what... I googled quick to like see because I was like, I know he had an action figure in the '90s, so I googled yeah. quick to like look at it, and like he's got more recent ones too that are like much more on on model also than the <laughs> '90s one. The '90s <laughs> one looks a little weird. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. The CG ones look a little bit better, like a little bit nicer in, in my opinion. But um, excellent. So, so um. Pat, with that that sort of like fairly, uh, it sounds like of the three of us, you had the least mm-hmm. uh, like or like exposure or, or kind of like awareness of of the character beforehand. What was that like? Um, I feel like I, I had a, a general idea. Like I mm-hmm. feel like what I thought Usagi was turned out to be majority, like the majority correct. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's good. Yeah, but I mean, based on. When I got through like two and a half prologues, it's like, okay, I think I know where this is going. I think I know the general gist of this kind of story. The yeah, so I think samurai. we're like, we're talking around the first two discussion questions. So I think let's just hit them. Mm-hmm. I think it would be better to take Cal's first and then do mine. So Cal's is, do you think reading the preceding 11 years of story before Grasscutter was necessary? Pat, it sounds like it's a no from you. Um, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't. To understand the general like tone and theme of the book, no, I don't think it's necessary. I think the story is clear enough what's going on. Potentially, I wouldn't know for sure, but potentially like establishing backgrounds for some of these characters. I assume that mm-hmm. almost the majority of these people that we run into have had stories yes. in the past that set them up, like the the disgraced general, the, mm-hmm. the, the mm-hmm. former monk or former samurai turned monk. Yep. And that kind of stuff. And like the cat ninjas, I thought that was the one thing that's like, oh, that's weird. There's a cat ninja and then it's gone and it shows up again and it's gone again. It's like they yeah. probably have more in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes is the very short answer. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was listening to a, um, an interview with Stan Sakai uh, earlier today. I also was on my run. And one of the things that he, he was talking about there was that like his his approach to writing Sagi Ojimbo from like day one has been that this is just one big story that there are obviously sort of like fairly discrete uh, kind of like arcs within that and in fact like the vast majority of the stories are almost kind of like one shot sort of like done in one single issue complete uh, sort of like units of storytelling um, but you do get sort of lots of recurring characters uh, that crop up and I think yeah almost everybody in this uh, is somebody that's 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 been you know t- to a greater or lesser extent a sort of recurring character uh, at some point in the yeah in the sort of yeah twelve to fifteen years uh, so before this this particular story. I had a sense that all like the recent history was actually part of the comics. Like you can correct me if I'm wrong, but like the the young Panda Lord that say that his mm. father died. Does mm-hmm. that happen in the comic itself? Or is it off off page? That is a good question. I think so. so you, you definitely I mean, what eleven years of comics I'm asking you. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, can you just like poke back and remember? Yeah, do you remember? Does he die in this? Yeah. Uh, no, no. Uh, Noriyuki doesn't, or uh, the young one doesn't. Uh, his father. You're introduced to him. I think you're introduced to him maybe as he dies, um, okay. or like like his his first appearance is kind of like the point at which he is leaving the story. But like uh, Noriyuki, the young sort of panda lord, is uh, like a, a big character in preceding stories, uh, as is his sure. body bodyguard uh, as well, uh, Tomoe. But I don't think any of that that his it would definitely added to the characters and fleshed mm-hmm. out like their connections between them. But I think what's here is sufficient for the story that's being told Mm -hmm. yeah yeah no i think that's and honestly that's that's really 
reassuring <laughs> for me to hear as well, I think, because as, uh, like I say, as I was, I read everything in Usagi Ojimbo in order. So by the time that I'd got to sort of grass cutter as a story, there'd probably been several thousand pages worth of story that I'd already gone through uh, sure. by that point, or a couple of thousand uh, uh, sort of pages of story to go through. And so there's lots of stuff where... I, I think I think it gen- generally speaking does a really good job of making it accessible to somebody that's joining for the first time. But there is a there's clearly a huge amount of like history and backstory to almost every character, and that in some cases sort of heightens the emotional impact of stuff or the dramatic tension. Say so it's probably um, more impactful for people who have been with these characters for so long to see yeah. the situations. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, but I'm, I'm I'm relieved to hear that like it it still functions uh, uh, so without without that that kind of prior knowledge. Well, I yeah. think it's it's also beneficial that the the author obviously has such affinity to the samurai tropes of the Kurosawa mm-hmm. stories. Mm-hmm. And if you know anything about those, it's mm-hmm. clear the kind of story that's being told here, which I think is yeah, it, it benefits from. What about you, Matt? What do you feel? No, I was let just let you guys talk. I the only I think additional point I want to make is I think Sakai does a really good job of doing the thing monthly comics used to be really good at and aren't as much anymore, where you put exposition in the captions or the dialogues without yes. it feeling like exposition. Mm-hmm. Um, like there's a there's a bit specifically where Usagi calls Jen bounty hunter instead of Jen, mm-hmm. and like at the yes. start of one of the issues, and like. That's clearly on purpose, right? So you like know yes. it's like, hey, this is what this rhino guy's deal is. Mm-hmm. Um, there, oh, there was another. Oh, they were explaining like the the conspiracy of eight and like the yes. the stealing of the document and stuff. And like a lot of that stuff's exposition, but like it makes sense for them to be talking about that at that moment too. Like the book does a really good job of giving you the pieces you need to understand what's going on and feel the impact of it, even if you haven't read the eleven years of stuff beforehand. I think. Yeah, no, that's that. Yeah, I, and and I think that's well. Yeah, like I say, that's that's really heartening to hear. I think stuff with like the conspiracy of eight that that had been like a growing uh, sort of thing in the in the story for a couple of years, uh, sort of preceding Grasscutter at that point. And I think uh, things like uh, uh, Ikeda, the disgraced general, uh, he had like a really amazing sort of like engaging uh, mm-hmm. sort of story that came yeah probably a, f- a couple of years before before this as well. Well, that's actually like the one thing I think that when I was flipping through it again yesterday kind of missed for me is like the cliffhanger ending of chapter four is Akeda <laughs> turning his face towards the camera. And the first time I read it, it was like, that dude sure does have a mustache. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I, don't, I don't understand how I'm supposed to feel about this. But I kind of like understanding that he had shown up before and that you as a reader, like you, Cal, as a reader would know like, Oh shit! This guy hates yeah. this panda boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like when when I was rereading this um, uh, a couple of weeks for the first time a couple of weeks ago, um, I'd I'd forgotten. I'd, I'd sort of been going back through like from the start again. So when I got to, uh, but I'd completely forgotten that Ikeda, the disgraced general, uh, is in Grasscutter. And when it got to that point uh, in this, in, in this, was that I when did, you settled on your question? <laughs> oh well, I just, I just, well, p- partly, yeah, I did, I did start to think, oh no, oh no, <laughs> what if none of this means anything without that? But also, if 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 you have, you know, sort of like been on that that journey sort of through the book. That is an astonishing cliffhanger. <laughs> like that is very exciting because it was like I don't know. He's he's a very interesting, exciting character who, yeah, just absolutely fucking hates the guts of, of the uh, sort of the young, uh, sort of vulnerable uh, lords. That um, you know you uh, you've got some degree of uh, emotional investment in. Uh, again, whether or not you've read uh, all of the preceding stories. Um, no, but... and like, even while that, that cliffhanger, I don't think worked for me as a reader, not having mm-hmm. read it before. I think Akeda as a character from that point on really worked. Mm-hmm. And I like really enjoyed reading about him and his struggle of like, Hey, this is the son of the Lord I was trying to overthrow, but it's not the same guy. And I've, my mm-hmm. life has also changed. And like, I can't murder him in front of my family. Cause I like him <laughs> being able to like live with my family to, <laughs> turns out um so like that like his arc overall works and i think that speaks more to it than like one failed like shock panel at the end of a chapter mm-hmm. right like um i kind of want to ask you the reverse question before we get away from this one as and i think you sort of answered it but like as someone who has been reading 
11 years of Usagi Yojimbo, like, is it more of like a heightened feeling? Because like Usagi mentions oh, like, yes. oh, I have a, like a bad, like I have bad time against Spearman. And like, that's clearly just yes. setting up the fight against G like later <laughs> on, like, but like, I've never seen him fight G before and you have. So like, how does that all pay off for you in this? Because there's so many, there's so many different threads, right? Like, as we talked about in the intro, like there's the yeah. action stuff, there's the political stuff, there's mm -hmm. the like... There's the characters we don't really actually get to spend that much time with. Like, in Azuma, I feel like I still don't actually mm. know that much about, honestly, yeah. coming out of the story. Oh, in Azuma. Amazing character. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to, to clarify that one for you. She is uh, very, she's really good. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, but I think in, in terms of uh, what it's like if if you have con gone through the kind of preceding stuff uh i mean uh, like absolutely amazing i think it is genuinely one of the most sort of exhilarating uh bits of asagi agenda which is a like as i was saying earlier just a freakishly consistently good uh comic all the time but this is just like a really heightened version of that and i think part of that is um as i was saying before frequently in Osagio Jumbo you have sort of like just standalone issues that tell a complete story um, but you often have this sort of recurring characters sort of cropping up uh, in those often it's just Osagi sort of going about his own business sometimes you just follow another character but like he'll frequently sort of interact with the same sort of well, well with a lot of the people in this book but they're usually sort of separated so this uh, I, I, was, I was thinking about um about this in terms of almost feeling like a crossover event but like in the best way possible where suddenly you just have you feel like you're on very unstable ground almost when like characters that haven't interacted before are suddenly sort of sharing the same space and characters that that often sort of occupy different kinds of stories because i think one of the the ways in which asagi ojimbo as a series has stayed so fresh over uh, sort of like close to four decades now um, is because it just paints on a really broad canvas and I think that they use these kind of different characters to tell different sorts of stories so uh, again uh, the bounty hunter um, is uh, he's sort of a really frequently reoccurring uh, sort of character he's maybe my favorite character in the in the series but he often sort of is there for stories that are kind of very grounded and are usually just about you know sort of um well, um, sort of like his exploits, bounty hunting and sort of Asagi getting mixed up in those. And they tend to be sort of quite grounded and sort of down to earth. And so suddenly when you have him interacting with Jay, uh, who Yeah, he's is... like fighting a demon samurai in this one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and it, you just, you feel really off balance and you suddenly have no idea, like, how is Gen going to sort of like fit into that? Or even sort of how is he going to get out of it? Um, and, and and so I, I think that, that that plays off really well. I think it also... Um, the, this story like the scope of it which is something that we've kind of alluded to a couple of times is just colossal and a part of that is like the span of time that's covered uh, i mean it goes back to sort of like mythical prehistory uh in in the prologues that the uh, ironically we'll we'll get to talking about much later mm -hmm. i'm sure um <laughs> but um but but it also like it's it's the scope of like characters because there the, are the whole sort of plot strands that are very that are all interwoven but like lots of characters that never meet although their you know their actions are affecting one another sort of throughout the whole story so um the the whole plot line with the disgraced general and uh, tomoe and noriyuki they don't interact whatsoever with gen isagi um inazuma jay um like the cons like barely with the conspiracy of eight uh, but it, it's all part of like this one big you know sort of um uh, shake up that's happening uh, to all of the characters at once, all centered around this this one sword, whether they know it or not. Um, so it, it's really exciting. Is the is, is the is the the short answer? Like maybe yeah, I could skip to near yeah. the end where Usagi's like talking to. Oh gosh, I can't remember the priest's name right this second. Tenshobo. But, oh yeah, um, Tenshobo, and he's like, yeah, I have the sword. I'm not even sure how I ended up with it. Like I only know <laughs> half the story. I feel like like feels very like as a reader reading it and being like oh yeah this political stuff like never quite even got into the like bit where they even know grass cutter has been recovered right like yes. yeah, yeah. kind of cool uh, but yeah uh, and everybody still kind of shows up in the same place though eventually just at different times because the village mm -hmm. that um uh tomo and oh gosh 
Nori- 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 Boy. <laughs> yes. Nori- Show yep. up at, at the end is the same village that Usagi was at, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 So. Um, and I think uh, something else that maybe maybe um, is easier for me to kind of like identify and feel sort of content and excited about when I'm reading something like this is uh, Stan Sakai frequently uh, will plan plot lines or like seed things for plot lines like ten years in advance. So so there's there's some stuff like uh, I'm trying to think. So Inazuma, uh, who uh, Matt you were saying is a character that you feel like you didn't get quite you know a full handle on this and that's largely i think because she's sort of comatose for the you know the, the majority yeah. of the book but like she's a character that has been on this like increasingly sort of like tragic scary path for sort of like for several years and in, in the in the story um up to this point and this is uh well it, it, it's not it's not the climax of her story but it's it's a really big significant beat seems like a pretty uh, big turning that. point yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I was, I was uh, again. I was, I was listening to some some interviews with Stan Sakai over the last couple of days, and there was one from a couple of years ago where he's talking about things that he's writing into the comics at the moment that he expects to pay off in well, like eight years. Now he said ten years uh, oh, at the time okay. as well. And I, I think it is, you know, it, like it's. I think it's one of the reasons that I find it so interesting and exciting because it is almost unmatched. I think in terms of that just like somebody being able to do that confidently um so, so there are things like that a lot of the political kind of intrigue in this is stuff that pays off in a big way you know sort of further down the line uh, and this is in in like either seeding or, or sort of progressing different elements of that um but but yeah like that's that's easier to, to have a perspective on when yeah a when when i've already read like you know the the following uh, sort of 22 years or whatever of the comics after this point uh, but also just having that broader familiarity with how the series works yeah because actually thinking about it for as much stuff as happens in this book the status quo doesn't actually change that much except for like Inazuma and Jay like mm-hmm. grass cutter is still not found as far as everyone else knows the conspiracy is <laughs> not really uncovered they're getting shaken yes. up a bit oh mm-hmm. Cal. Well, there is a there, there is a follow up story called Grass Cutter Two, which takes. Oh, place I know! I'm excited later. to read it. <laughs> Grass okay, Cutter Two. Cool, cool, cool. oh, Grass okay. Cutter. The cutting. Um, <laughs> I'm but, so tempted yes. to ask you about it now, but I think we should wait till the end. But <laughs> okay, okay. Um, but but anyway, sorry that that uh, I think maybe that answered the question that you asked me. <laughs> Yeah, it did. It definitely did. (laughs) You saying that it feels like a crossover event, I think, really Mm -hmm. answers the question for me. Because that, Mm -hmm. like, once you said that, that made a ton of sense to me of like, (laughs) here's all your faves. Here's this, like, big, potentially status quo changing event. Like, let's throw them all together in one spot. Like, Mm -hmm. and it's, um, I don't know. Yeah, like, it is just, I don't know. It's exciting. And I think that because the series, yeah, has this kind of stability and longevity, it means that. You, you go for these long, long periods without something like this happening. So when it does, I don't know when when, when it does feel like something momentous is uh, like is is playing out in front of you. Like it's just oh, I don't know. It's it's very exciting. There's a future story with uh, Jay uh, in it uh, where they're just sort of like cutting like like I don't know this, this like genuinely terrifying path like sort of going through like every character that isn't Asagi and just like killing or you know like messing them up in like uh, increasingly sort of like alarming ways and uh, and it, it just it like it I think because they're so sparing with doing this kind of thing where they throw together all of the different types of story that it just oh, I, I, it's so effective when it happens in a way that I don't think crossover events in you know sort of big two super superhero comics uh uh, I, I think they've they've probably lost that impact because it's now sort of like a regular kind of yeah, especially uh, days, sort of commercial, right? like commercial not prospect just, anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's just it's summer, so here's the here, his, his, put, his here's thing. all your faves, regardless of whether we really have a story to tell or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas this, Whereas, it's, yeah, it's, if it's there's really a story here, like, like, yeah, that's it. And it's like every eight years, maybe, and like it's it's very rarely sort of like I, I, like yeah, the 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 story the future story that i'm thinking of with jay where they just sort of turn up out of the blue and it just upends the type of story that you're thinking you're reading and then suddenly you've got this uh yeah sort of demonic serial killer just 
I don't know, sort of like going through what was previously, you know, just sort of like quite a lighthearted romp. And then he just, uh, anyway, it's, it's very exciting. And I think, I think that this is the first time that they, oh no, no, it's not the first time they do it. This, this is probably the second time they do this in the, in the, in Asagi Ojimbo, but like, that's the second time in, uh, yeah, in what, like about 15 years or something yeah, like that. Yeah, 10 to 12 years, depending on what yeah. you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, it's good. So we've talked about the fact that the story itself has a lot of energy, moves forward really quick, lots of plot threads. But before you get to the start of Grass Cutter, mm-hmm. there are four prologues. Mm-hmm. Yes, as, as, think... as, the, as there would be. <laughs> Do, yeah, sure. You know, <laughs> well, your story needs to have a prologue, and then a prologue to the prologue, and a prologue yeah. to the prologue to the prologue, yeah. and then a prologue yeah. to the prologue to the prologue. <laughs> Anyways, so the one first of my questions... 54 pages are a prologue. Mm. So I think it's, I was kind of looking based on the back covers or like the single issue covers that were in the back of my collection that I have. And it looks like it's a 10 part story and two parts are prologues if you look at it from like monthly issues. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. roughly 20% of this thing, prologues. Mm. How do we feel about that? <laughs> can, can I go first? I well, yes. Please do. Yeah. Because <laughs> I've, I've, I've got a very particular sort of view on it. Because I, I, I think it is it is quite jarring and i think particularly if you're not familiar with the series this could really throw you off because essentially yeah like you're saying the first sort of big chunk of the story you are bouncing between different elements of japanese folklore and uh sort of like real japanese history um as well um to uh, and I, th- I think at the first or certainly in the first reading it's not necessarily clear what the broader purpose of that is being that's being that's being served there um because i think you're not sort of retaining characters between each one it's quite sort of dense in its own way as well just sort of um but uh i think that there is uh, th- there's a couple of things that t- to me make it sort of like really worthwhile and engaging and, and exciting so i think the first one is one of the things that stan sakai is clearly very passionate about and he talked um sort of like uh, great lengths about this so this, this isn't me sort of you know sort of projecting onto him i don't think um but he's he's incredibly passionate about presenting and uh, preserving uh sort of elements of japanese culture um be that sort of like folklore or history and that that's one of the things that he's really interested in doing with asagi Ojimbo as a story in general so for this for, the, for this opening section i think that you do have um yeah just uh, at first sort of fairly just sort of direct recreations of um japanese folklore sort of talking about the creation of japan about the sort of creation of kind of evil spirits in japan uh, and sort of different gods and then that eventually leads sort of fairly directly into the creation of this sword the grass cutter uh, and I, I think i think it gives you a sense of you know sort of uh, and, and these are all sort of based on real uh sort of like elements of like folklore or like you know sort of cultural history uh in japan uh, the grass cutter sword is uh still an incredibly significant uh, sort of like artifact uh, in japan it's sort of in the possession of the current emperor um but it is not allowed to be viewed uh, or looked at but it is it, it's still like one of the symbols of kind of like legitimacy and um like authority uh in yeah in in modern japan um and i, th- I think that the prologues give you a good sense of just the, the the kind of scope and history and significance of this item that is then going to sort of become the uh, uh, the kind of pivot around which the rest of the story turns around. Um, so so I, th- I think it does a good job of that. I think it also just shows the kind of diversity of stories that Stan Sakai is interested in doing. I think like a- as you go through each of the, f- the prologues, like they're telling very different stories and they're they're done in sort of quite different styles as well. I think you know if if, if you look at the the kind of like dialogue and art in the uh, the the final prologue, uh, which is centered on the sort of naval battle uh, where Grasscutter uh, as a sword is lost, it looks and feels completely different to like the earlier sort of much grander kind of mythical ones, both in terms of like the art itself, but also, you know, the writing. Uh, and I, I find it really interesting and engaging as just a, a way to display the, the range of Stan Sakai, but also, yeah, to get this kind of like scope of history and culture that is like bearing down on people that like either are uninterested in that or like don't have a clear understanding of exactly what's at play but i think that 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 really heightens some of the subsequent tension for me when 
you know, people are getting caught up in events that are much, much bigger than them. And I think if, because you go back thousands of years or, you know, it's, it's time in memoriam uh, at the start, I think it, yeah, it, it lends a scope of, uh, sorry, a sense of grandeur that uh, I think sort of heightens some of the drama uh, later on. So. Yeah, I would actually completely agree. As the person who put the question in, I feel like it was, it may have felt leading of me being like, no, I don't like the prologues, but like, I actually really like the prologues. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of hand waving you kind of have to do. If you, like, you can't try to pay attention to everything in the prologues and like <laughs> track it and understand what's going on because that way madness lies. <laughs> like, I think if you try to remember the name of every single Kami in the first prologue, you're, you're, yeah, yeah. you're done. Like, if that's the type of reader you are too, then they're, they might not be for you. Yeah. But I think the point you made about it establishing just like the scope of the story and like why Grasscutter is important, like in a different version of this story, Grasscutter could totally just be like a MacGuffin you don't care about <laughs> at all, right? But we've spent 50 pages learning like why Grasscutter is actually important and like worthwhile and like is a, le a legitimate object that this many people in this country would care about. And it also makes the following story feel like it's part of this entire it makes mm. the following story feel like it's part of the legend right like yeah and that makes uh, it really feel that much bigger yeah. um so i actually think the prologues are necessary for a lot of those reasons especially if you're coming to it cold like pat and i are i think maybe where um i don't have like familiarity with the characters to draw me into the story as mm -hmm. much but I do have, hey, this is some big shit that's going down. Like, it, this is the epic crossover event of Usagi Yojimbo, but also it's, like, part five of the story <laughs> of Grasscutter, this, like, epic <laughs> sword. So, Pat, how do you feel about the prologues? I agree to some extent what you guys are saying. I do feel that Sakai was a little too indulgent in his explaining of the the legendary history of the sword. I think it could have been told much more concise than what it is here. I think the entirety of the first prologue probably isn't necessary. I think that's kind of a fair criticism, honestly. Like, the first ten pages of it are stuff that, like, I don't think I'm gonna... They're not relevant to the story. Well, are it's relevant, relevant, to, it's relevant to the, the story world? of the sword because it's, it's Amaterasu and Susano where they came from. But mm -hmm. yeah, for the story of Usagi, not necessary. I, th I think it also depends on what you, what what we consider what we consider the aim, the aim of them to be. Because I think it, it like some of it I think is Stan Sakai is interested in this stuff, and I, I maybe Pat this like <clears throat> I think either this is indulgent sort of like as as you as uh, you suggested, or or it's just this is what he cares about. This is what he wants. The you know th th this is something that he thinks is worthwhile sort of getting across and it's just it's it's a place to do that that then serves the broader context but i think uh, like i can i can see uh, like the, the prologue was one of the bits that i was most worried about when i was doing my reread because because it felt like it would be incredibly easy to bounce off it because it doesn't well, i mean it's yeah it, it doesn't it doesn't directly influence the events of the, the rest it's of interesting the story, but... stories and i have had heard like orochi and Susano. i've i've Mm -hmm. heard that one before i've played okami the video game about amaterasu that goes through that uh, story sort of and this, this grass cutter is actually in that game too which i thought was pretty cool <laughs> um but yeah i mean like in the i guess the detail to which he goes into the past of grass cutter is probably where it loses me like the battle where the sword is lost to the sea i feel like it could have been cut back a little bit because it's important history and folklore of japan and i think it's it's an interesting thing to read but i wasn't necessarily reading this for that i guess I, I was going into this with the understanding that it would be it felt more educational to me than it did entertainment and so i was sort of disconnecting from it because of that i definitely mm -hmm. get that and like it is hard to show up for this book that says usagi yojimbo on the cover and the yeah, actual yeah. Usagi Yojimbo story doesn't start until page, what, mm -hmm. 56 or 57? Mm -hmm. And he still doesn't show up for a while, right? Like, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you pick up with Jay first, I think, right? Yeah, Jay yep. Azuma, yeah, Jay is murdering you... that like band of lords in the, yes. in the mountain pass. <laughs> so yeah, Jay like, things. 
I think part of the reason I wanted to ask the question is I thought one of well i i kind of thought you <laughs> if it was going to be one of the three of us one. would would have the criticisms of the prologue that i think are definitely like they merit it a little bit of um like some of the battle stuff is a bit drawn out but at the same time like you get to see stan sakai draw this giant battle this kind no, of cool. it's really well it's well done it's very well done but it's clear that sakai for these pro- prologues was more interested in in conveying the history and the gravity of J- Japan than necessarily telling the story of, of Usagi's encounter with the sword. I think you could convey the the history of the sword more concisely. I think that is something that could have been done, but obviously Sakai made the choice to spend 50 plus pages telling you, no, this is a big deal. This sword <laughs> is the real thing. Which yeah, I think I think that kind of does, and we're kind of Pat. Did you decide whether you want to do your your history folklore question? Because I think we sure. are dovetailing into it right why, now. Why not? We go, go into it. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're dovetailing. So yeah, one of my questions is whether or not the inclusion of the of Japanese folklore and history into this story is a benefit or a detriment to it. And I mean, I would think I'm sort of split. I think the fact that it does follow Japanese history gives it weight, whereas it's not just a silly comic book about a samurai rabbit. It's actually, you know, these things are actually historically something similar happened in Japan. So, but at the same time, these prologues. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, I, I just I can't believe that every book that I've brought here, you've always been banging on, asking for a map, saying that you want a map in, in the book. Where is my map? Every book that I bring, and this time I bring a, a book with two maps. I'm looking it's at true. them right now. It's very true. Touché. <laughs> Touché. <the> <laughs> um, but no, no. Like I, yeah. I, 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 I think I think you've articulated a lot of the things that I was that I was as I was rereading. It, I was like, oh, is this going to be? how how this reads like if you're coming in cold to the story is I an will unusual tell you, start Kel, i did bounce off the prologue once like i read the first two pages and i was like okay i'm just gonna have to like i'm just gonna have to <laughs> read through it and like understand that i don't need to know all this and keep going and like <laughs> once i once i got into that mindset i was good but i did come in and bounce off it a couple times yeah and this, I, th- I think that's I, th- I think that's entirely legitimate, and I think that particularly because it is such an unusual start to a book. And I, 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 th- I think that that is, you know, sort of paid off uh, f- further in. But I think, yeah, it is uh, that 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 doesn't surprise me, and it doesn't seem, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, illegitimate at all. Let me be clear: I don't think the prologue is poorly done. I think it's it's a very well done story and it, no, it does what the author bad. set out you for can it to do say it's too much <laughs> yes i i do think it could have been cut back but at the same time i feel like sakai would feel like that's doing a disservice to the history of his his nation so like mm-hmm. what are you gonna do you know? yeah there's a whole deep dive in the back into his sources and stuff that he read through mm. and like oh, how yeah. he was trying to compile the, the different records put in the time there's yeah. no, you cannot say he didn't there is there's a later story in Asagi Agenda that I love and I think about it quite a lot because it is it's it, like about, probably about a third of it is just going through the process for making soy sauce and the different types of soy sauce <laughs> and and then there's there, there's like a murder mystery or something that takes place in like a, <laughs> who cares? Making a soy sauce but like that bit's really stuck with me and I think there's just there's, there's something really interesting about using sort of you know action adventure comics as a platform to also just do this kind of i, I mean I, I think you said it's it felt sort of slightly educational earlier pat and i think i i think that that is absolutely the intention um but i think that's just really interesting like i would uh, i for one would love it if i opened up a spider-man book and uh-huh. you know as, as he was like swinging across a bridge he was like wow Maybe I should go and talk to somebody that that you know is an architect or like worked at the you <laughs> yes. know like <laughs> works at the museum of bridges. Um, I, I should have thought about this analogy more. But um... well, I mean, one of the major allures of Japanese culture is its history, right? It's an ancient it's still culture. Fucking deep, right? Yeah, everything mm-hmm. like you were saying, soy sauce, 
has an yes. ancient history. Yeah, the yeah, traditions yeah. have been passed on for longer than, certainly longer than America's been a thing, yes. than most yeah, Western yeah. civilization has been a thing. So, yes, I think, yeah, I don't know. It's, I'm completely split in two here because I do love <laughs> that part of Japanese culture, but at the same time, 56 pages. <laughs> yes. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. I tell yeah. you that, without the prologues, we don't get to learn about the crabs. And if we don't get to learn about the crabs, <laughs> the whole story falls apart. <laughs> I think that's the faces be... of the defeated samurai. Yeah. So the reason yeah. we were talking like off mic via Discord, whatever, about like whether the prologue, like do you find the prologues necessary? And do you think the historical in like historical elements are a boon or a detriment? Like, are those the same question? And I don't think they are the same question because the historical elements continue throughout, right? Like, mm -hmm. the whole story is, like, set well, in Well, it's framed period. around the shogunate, right? The fact that there's mm -hmm. yeah, people right? like in the political in, system of Japan. I was trying to match it up with, because my other big, like, Japanese story that I've been really into is Roroni Kenshin, which is going to be my oh, recommendation yeah, yeah. when we get to the yes. end of this. Mm -hmm. um, so I was trying to match up where this fits timeline wise with Roroni Kenshin. It's like 200 years earlier, I think. Right. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Cause that takes place just as like in like the late 1800s or so. Right. Is yeah. That... It's actually yeah. after the emperor of... has regained power. <laughs> part yes. of the reason yeah. why the prologues were there, I think is because Sakai wanted to point out the political upheaval that is being experienced in Usagi's current history is a direct line from this mythological origins like yeah you, you know, don't you can separate japan's history <laughs> right you can't separate japan's history from the commies are going to be there. like commies going to be there we're going to have <laughs> yeah so if we I had get actual that. episode titles that weren't the title of the book that would be the title <laughs> of the episode by the way <laughs> As as a series, uh, Sagi Ajembo is something that mixes sort of folklore with history, just like all the time. Like it's it's like a key part of like you know just the series appeal. I think for me at the very least, and I think yeah, it's... even in here, right? Like I didn't until you guys said it, or I, like I think Kelly, maybe you said it. Like I didn't realize grass cutter was a real sword that the emperor still mm. has in real Japan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and I think that maybe I think that the folklore element of it. I mean, I think part of it is. Dan Sakai likes drawing monsters and sort of sure. drawing sort of like that, like that two panel of Orochi and Susano. Great. is gorgeous. I love it. Yes. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think it, you know, um, I, I don't think I'd, I, I don't think I'd really reflected before on, on the way that that, that is true, you know, just, just sort of like in a lot of Japanese culture and then like the grass cut swords current status and, you know, sort of like it, it is a really good example of that. And I think that, it would be such a different series if it didn't have the folklore elements present in it. And I think it would, uh, I think it would be a poorer one. I think that it's, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, like I, I really enjoy just sort of like how, how, how much you learn about sort of Japanese culture, like over the 30 odd years uh, of comics at this point, but also, um, yeah, just sort of like within each story about like the, the specific interplay between uh, sort of, yeah, sort of folklore and history and how that, is relevant to Stan Sakai now as uh, somebody that's you know sort of particularly interested in preserving and promoting uh, Japanese culture. I think that it's yeah I don't know yeah I, I never thought before about whether or not it would th like the story like this story or just the series as a whole would work without the folklore elements. But I think it would be so radically different that it's genuinely very difficult for me to imagine like what the series would be like. So I think it, it's it's just really baked into its DNA. Sure. Um, yeah, I can understand. That. I guess my comparison would be like because Sakai has taken so many cues from Kurosawa. Like mm -hmm. Seven Samurai is a great mm -hmm. film, great characters. I don't. I didn't need to. Like, there's no. The problem is that you said anything in Japan, it it just comes with right. <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the Japan is ancient. It's steeped in history, and anything it does, anything. Samurai themselves are a result of, so it's hard to divorce the two, but like Seven Samurai doesn't tell you the origin of of the of Japan kind of thing before you get into. No, but then that was made for a Japanese audience. Sure. True. And like how, so thinking about it, even reading the back matter where Sakai was discussing like, okay, this history says it's this way and this history says it's this way, like 
where do you even draw the line between history mm-hmm. and folklore, especially in mm-hmm. a in a culture like Japan of like how much of it feels like it's just history because that's the way it was written in the first mm-hmm. place. Like the crabs, right? Like I keep coming back to these crabs because <laughs> like the crabs are named the like the way they are because they have the faces of fallen soldiers and like that's a historical fact. <laughs> like that's like. <laughs> Well, like that's not even that's not even folklore. Have you looked at pictures of them? They are I incredibly actually. bizarre. Okay, well, I'd, I mean, Matt, you got to bring back the show notes. You got uh, to. I, had, like, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't get as deep into researching this one as I had hoped for. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think there's a way to tease one out from the other, especially for Sakai himself. But like, even I feel like other things that are set in like Japanese. I'm trying to think now. I'm thinking like. Does Kenshin have weird folklore stuff in it? It doesn't as much, I guess. So maybe it's a Sakai specific thing. I'm not sure, but like, well, it was like Yojimbo, the other Kurosawa film that mm-hmm. that Usaki Yojimbo gets its name from. Like, it's mm-hmm. just a story. It's a story of corrupt crime bosses, right? And a bodyguard trying to protect a family. Mm-hmm. What it boils down, but I, I guess I don't know. I, I keep going back to the fact that if it's set in Japan, like just Japan comes with this just baked in so i don't know i don't know where i stand anymore i don't know (laughs) and to me it feels very much like we've talked about the two flavors of sci-fi kind of right where there's sci-fi where it's the real world but it goes like one element further Mm. and there's sci-fi where you make up an entire different world and like Mm. for a lot of people that have come on this podcast with us the one that works is our world with like extra elements and that's kind of what this is, except it's magic instead of science fiction stuff, or like mm. folklore instead of science fiction stuff. How oh, dare you? Are you using Dune against me, Matt? Is that what you just <laughs> did? Using Dune is that what you just did? <laughs> no, I was actually thinking about our barrier discussion with Kat, where we were talking. I think that's where we got really deep into like the two flavors of sci-fi, um, because Kat will always bounce off of like, "Hey, here's this entirely new world like of mm-hmm. sci-fi bullshit, and you've got to learn what an arrow spanner is before you can go any further." But she <laughs> really loves stuff where it's like, "Here's real world, but now these characters have been brought to a spaceship, like that sort mm-hmm. of thing." Um, yeah. And that's kind of what this feels like too, where it's like real world, except people are animals, animals are dinosaurs. <laughs> And also, there's crabs that are that have people faces, but those are actually historically accurate. Yeah, and I guess maybe this will go into your question because yeah, it, there's a strange juxtaposition of super serious history folklore that need, that is adhered to and followed and is, is shaping the rest of the story. But it's about these cartoon animals. Can I go you one better at this, Pat. Sure. This is a book about politics. This is a politics book. Like, there's swords and stuff, but at the end of the day, this book is about people trying to overthrow government. Mm -hmm. And it's a cartoon rhino in it. So, like, the juxtaposition of, like, subject matter to characters and art style to me, like, this could be a completely different book if illustrated a different way. Like, if the people, instead of dying, like, and having a little word skull. balloon that had a skull in it like yeah. their heads were actually chopped off or whatever like this could be this could be like a, a thriller dark whatever gritty nonsense book and instead it is what it is and i think that's worth examining because i'm trying to figure out like whether like is there a world where the dark version is better i don't think so honestly <laughs> dark version being human oh just like the characters? the quote-unquote realistic one right like even if you keep all the folklore elements and stuff, this could easily be written and illustrated in a style that it's not as cartoony and like the violence is more violent and like the people are not as, I guess, like are more realistic looking. Like this could, it could be a completely different book in tone mm-hmm. while having the same exact plot, I feel like, if that makes sense. Do you know, is this comic written for a Western audience? Is it written in English? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, okay. so Stan Sakai is third generation Asian American, grew up in Hawaii. Um, okay. all right. So, so and, and like all of his comics are published. I mean, like they're published in loads of languages, but written and uh, initially published in English. Yeah, and mostly published originally by American publishers. Yes, IDW. Right? Yes, is the currently that's the, yeah, that's the current one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, in any of the interviews, Cal. Has Sakai ever said what audience he was trying to target with these? 
comics? So yes, yeah, he, talk, he talks about this quite a lot, and so uh, and I think this is because the question comes up in in interviews uh, sort of relatively frequently. Why use anthropomorphic animals? Um, because I, th- I think that does set quite a lot of the tone, and it, it, it's something that I, f- I find really interesting because I think uh, maybe just because I was introduced to it as this is a story about a rabbit with a top knot, his ears tied into a top knot, and he's a samurai. And so, like, I've never had that initial step of like considering if it should be something else necessarily. Sure. Um, but uh, I think that that yeah, it, it's really frequent question. I think that uh it's it's interesting as well because uh, like re- like doing some research for this like i was reading like a lot of stuff from like big you know sort of like heavyweights and sort of like you know the comics industry or the com- or comics criticism uh sort of talking about their love for the series and almost all of those had a brief description of how each person had to like wrestle with and overcome their initial resistance to the anthropomorphic animals and like feeling as though it was a book exclusively for children i think that this is despite being like really incredibly violent at different points like sometimes when you see the aftermath of like a scene where jay has you know sort of been killing people and like you see just like stuff stuff that if if these were not anthropomorphic animals it would be significantly more disturbing it would be shocking right like yeah yeah, yeah. the first sequence in the actual story is just jay murdering a bunch of people. there's a lot of death and murder and then, in this comic book yeah so, so i think i think you would you would lose some of that i think that uh stan sky has said that like he he initially conceived of the characters of osagi as a human and in my continuing quest for show notes to come back i've just posted a picture <laughs> i just of saw that, that actually the the picture. <laughs> so um <laughs> so I hope anybody that's listening to this is able to see this as well. Um, but like he, 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 did, he, did, he did, he did, he did, he did initially um, sort of conceive of the character as as being human, um, but then was just sort of like playing around, drew him as a rabbit. And he was like, oh, that's more fun, and then just went with that. So like there wasn't like a huge kind of like you know sort of tortured, thought out process necessarily to sort of starting making it about uh, or like starring exclusively anthropomorphic animals. But something that I read um, when I was, when I was sort of doing some research on this was um, something that uh, Will Eisner had written about uh, Usagi Ojimbo. One of the things oh, that, he, that, he, that, that he suggested was... Can we that... talk about that? Because I think it's if you're talking about the same thing that was the introduction of the volume that I believe Pat and I both have, like mm-hmm. I found that to be one of the most condescending things I've Oh, incredibly read. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but I, think, I think that there is something genuinely... Uh, I don't think that it was a good uh, piece overall, uh, particularly because the first half of it was him just saying, I never thought that comics could be different outside of America. And then I went to right, like, oh, turns out comics are actually very popular, no, very diverse. Like, the guy has done it in the American style. It's just like, yeah. A, he is an American. B, yeah. Yeah. fuck off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, we can all tell Will Eisner to fuck off. We've all read Old Spirits, uh, Issues of the Spirit, which are absolutely no good in 2021. Um, but uh, I think that there was something interesting that he said there about the ability to kind of, because because you've got these sort of like broadly kind of caricatured and sort of like animal faces uh, for everybody that it, it can allow you to sort of project onto them sort of quite a bit as well. And I think I do that a lot as I'm, as I'm reading through. I think that uh, like Jen, uh, oh, sorry, Ken, uh, as a character i think he's i think he's meant to be like toshiro mifune i think he's got that sort of like five o'clock shadow all the time and he's constantly sort of like rubbing his chin in the way that toshiro mifune was famous for doing in things like yojimbo um mm-hmm. but uh, but like th- th- there is something quite nice about i don't know that it, like it, it does feel like it's easy to just sort of like add add to it in your own head uh because there is that level of abstraction in the first place um that maybe you would lose out on if it was all sort of like hyper realistic, you know, anatomically correct uh, humans in these stories. Yeah, and I think one of the things you said about Sakai being like, "Oh, this is more fun," I think <laughs> totally makes sense to me. Like <laughs> the story, like if you see all these people die on the page, the story actually just like gets really dark and depressing. I feel like, mm. whereas like this, it's more. It feels kind of more like the folklore tales that he seems really interested in, I think, because all the characters mm-hmm. are animals and the violence is presented the way it is and like and mm-hmm. death is presented the way it is too. Like it's more fairy tale than assassination, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is kinda nice. Um, as a reader. And like I think the cartooniness does a couple other things for it. 
where one is, I think I told you guys I was sitting down and I was like planning to read the first half of this because again, big book, like 250 pages. And I ended up reading the whole thing in one evening. And I think that is partly because the art is so like is so clean and like so easy to read that you mm-hmm. can get through the book that fast. Um, I definitely missed some things like going through it that quickly, but it was in, like a very enjoyable read and a very speedy read, I think, because of that. And I think, well, it's definitely not a comic for children. You could potentially give it to children, like of yeah. a certain age at yeah. least. Whereas if it was the other way around and like was realistic, I'm not sure I'd feel as comfortable doing that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, I can see that. I think it's an incredibly, just as, as a comic in general, it's incredibly accessible. And I think that the art is part of that. I think part of that is because of, yeah, you get that degree of like distance from the bloodshed that's really frequently sort of playing out, but also... I, th- I think part of it is like Stan Sakai is an incredibly accomplished like artist at this point, and, and uh, you know that um, uh, when you look back at like very early uh, so like Asagi Ojumbo stories, like it's bananas how fully formed it kind of springs off. Like you can absolutely see kind of like a uh, like a refining of his you know sort of like talents and and like his vision for the for the world and like how everything looks and you know like the the types of things that he's. Uh, interested in, I don't know, sort of like trying out in terms of like storytelling and like layout and and, and all the rest. But I, I, like he's such a good cartoonist that you, even with these kind of like simplified, sort of slightly abstract faces, you get a really good sense of like, or I, I think you get a very good sense of like who everybody is with like a relative like economy of lines as well. Like it's like it is simple. It's really simple and straightforward. Um, but I don't know, just very effective. I think. Yeah, I'm looking at the sequence on like 66 and 67 where Inazuma forces that guy to drink his own poison tea. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and like the faces in that set of three. Well, I guess even the first panel on that page on 66 is just like the guy's eyes <laughs> and like the sweat coming down his fur, mm-hmm. I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, just like it's you, he still gets a lot of emotion across with the like with the economy line you were talking about and then there's mm-hmm. one of the classic hey i'm dead speech bubbles yes yes i do is. actually truly love like <laughs> as a as a signifier of like yes that one's dead i don't know if, i don't know if you get to tell this in this book but when different types of animal die they've got different little speech bubbles that come out of them as well that reflect I what they're cool that, at least like i kind of noticed that they were different i don't know if i tracked it to <laughs> to each one you were saying the the minimal lines conveyed different characters i got a little confused about the difference between some of the characters just because the so i will say are... tomoe and, and tomoe uh, yeah and inazuma yeah, Correct. except like once I, was... I figured out their hair was different, <laughs> I, mm. I got it, but it took me a little bit. Right, yeah, that was my problem because very, very similar in design. At some point, he's drawing Tomoe from the back, and I could be <laughs> Imazuma, could be. And the fact that it jumps from Imazuma's story to Tomoe a couple times threw me into, oh, wait, who are we with this time? Oh, wait, okay, there it is. Her bangs are split in two, that's Tomoe. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Uh, that, that that makes perfect sense and i think the fact that it's in black and white as well uh like the, the most recent most recently since it's um started being published by idw it's colorized uh so like in full for the first time which is interesting after decades mm. of, of black and white stuff but it does it does also help sidestep some of those some of those issues where just coloring will signify things that you can't necessarily sure. get across in, in black and white i'm wondering about that actually because i think i had heard that idw was doing them in color and that feels mm-hmm. like kind of a different book to me and i wonder even like because i don't think because i was reading the credits at the back and i said sakai was a letterer on some other stuff but like has he done mm-hmm. other color work in the past outside of covers i guess i would assume yeah th- I mean, th- there's been a handful of like osagi ojimbo stories that have been colored over the years but it's usually sort of special events or like you know just like like one shot issues one off and stuff yeah exactly yeah so i think i, I mean I, d- I don't know about his broader experience, I know he's done he he's done a lot more lettering on other stuff, but I think the majority of his work has been black and white, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, I would be curious to read one of those in color and see how it it compares to this, because I actually liked that it was in black and white. I mean, a it kind of makes it feel like an old school samurai movie, like you were talking mm-hmm. about, Pat. Um, mm-hmm. And B, I think it like sometimes stuff that's in black and white is just easier to read because there's less thing like 
elements mm. to process on the page too. Although it does lead to some of the the stuff Pat was talking about where it can be hard to ID some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, just with the anthropomorphic characters and everything, I think the cartoon skews younger. Like I would say 10 to 13 is probably the ideal demographic for this. Yeah, uh, I, I think I think anywhere from there upwards sounds about right to me. I think there are occasionally like incredibly dark and uh, sort of like disturbing stories, often ones that have got J in them, but not not exclusively. Um, sure. But I think, but but I think even then, yeah, you tend to see the aftermath of his violence as opposed to the enacting of it um, itself. So I think that that probably does broaden out that. Yeah, and usually it's not like people with a bunch of gaping wounds. It's people with just like shell shocked faces, which are just yes. like which are also very scary, but not the same <laughs> the same thing. Like not the mm-hmm. same category. Mm-hmm. I guess we're. On the topic of Jay, Pat. Yeah, so it is sort of just dovetailing into my question about what makes Jay an evil character. Because he's evil. We were told multiple times he's evil. He even mm. says, I don't know if he himself calls himself evil, but no, he, he actually could no, be he, like, he, they are evil because Jay flips gender by the end of this. Yes, yeah, that's true. That's true. And I found it interesting reading up on him that Jay is inspired from. Okay, Matt, if you were going to be polite to this character, what would you call him? If I was going to be polite to him? Yes, you're in Japan. This man comes up to you and you're being polite. What do you call him? The answer is Jason. Now, Matt, what does the name Jason trigger in you knowing what this character is? Oh, gosh, you're just making me think of the question is actually. <laughs> Jason Voorhees. He's based off of Jason Voorhees. Oh, okay. See, I haven't seen those movies. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. But yeah, I found that very light and pretty funny too that he used that yes. as a... <laughs> that is a... That's a great <laughs> gag, actually. <laughs> I think I think it's all the better because they never make anything of it in the comic. Like, I, I, it's the type of thing that I'm, I'm sure would have been very obvious if you're reading it, you know, in the late 80s when uh, Jay makes his first appearance. Uh, like, I feel that like that would have been something that would have been much easier to put together, but it is... A very funny, very silly pun. Uh, yep. That yep. I, I, say, I, really I do enjoy. feel like you just Batman sixty six to me, like real good. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> this bird sitting upside down in a tree with fifteen <laughs> pounds. No, no, no. <laughs> Gonna be polite to Jay. You call him Jason. I was, I was really interested by your question about uh was it whether or like what makes no it was what makes jay an evil character yeah, why is, that, is, is that jay right an evil yeah why is he yeah. an evil character so just before i get into that just to cross the streams a little bit with the sandman uh sort of episodes that you're doing Let's at the moment, do it. i oh are we challenging never, the, I've, of the question I've, I've, <laughs> I've, 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 never, I've, I've never i've never sort of wished that there was an opportunity like a an capacity to just like dial into a podcast that you're listening to uh more than the absolute nonsense that i heard about whether or not like <laughs> defending desire the most like horrific character oh no in that, in that never story. mind you're you're with matt you can't say anything anymore <laughs> the uh anyway so so it did it did make me re- reconsider sort of the approach that i might need to take to answering this one because I, like, I just felt like all guys, remember off. cal if you're zero percent moral that just means that you're like <laughs> you're you never of having had, to be and moral. don't have the capacity for continue anyway sorry all right i just, I just thought i'd throw that in but uh, I, th- I think I, th- I think that like there is something fun like i think i mean jay's not like a massively deep character which I think is why, like, he's used frequently just with, like, it, in exactly the right doses. Like, he, you, you go sort of, like, years between seeing Jay, and it's always, like, absolutely horrifying whenever he turns up because he's just, l- like, he's from a different story or, like, a completely different genre because I think he he mentions in this, like, right at the start of the book where, you know, he described himself as an emissary for the gods and he's there to, you know, sort of... The blade of the gods. Purge, the yeah, the, yeah, the blade of the gods, which is very metal. That's very cool. I like that a lot. <laughs> um, but he's, uh, yeah, he, he's sort of fixated on the idea of, like, purging evil from the world or what he perceives to be evil from the world. And I don't know, I can't remember off the top of my head, like, to what extent you get this pick, like, you get this in this story in particular, but he has a particular bizarre fixation on Asagi as well. And he's convinced that sort of uh, 
Usagi being alive is the thing, like specifically Usagi being alive is the thing that stands between him and being able to ascend to godhood. Um, yeah. yeah, which is, uh, I think, a fun uh, motive and it's made all the more fun, I think, in that Usagi in every one of their sort of like encounters has got absolutely no time for that, just doesn't engage with it at all. He's still like, like, just sort of like basically He's trash just like, okay, I guess we're fighting. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Which I think is a nice way to undercut that. But I think, uh, I mean, uh, I think I think it's very difficult to read this and see the sort of like wholesale violent slaughter that he engages on without even blinking and see him as being anything other than evil. But there is there is something that's really interesting and quite murky, I think, about like exactly what it is that is driving him. Because he clearly has supernatural powers, right? Like we see hit we see the spirit Jay inhabit another body by the end of this uh this story after Isagi defeats uh defeats Jay. And the fact that he, like, something is directing him towards Grasscutter at a certain point, right? Like, he's got some weird radar. Yeah, he gets summoned it. towards Grasscutter. And, like, yeah. while the battle is going on, there's yeah. earthquakes and stuff. And, like, he explodes into a shower of yes. spirits, I guess, or yes. something. Yeah. Like, everyone yes. in... Like, nuclear ghosts. Like, <laughs> Usagi and Jen are both, like, trying to deny the yes. the otherworldliness of him throughout that entire yes. battle. But, like, mm-hmm. it's pretty clear from looking from the outside that... yeah something's going on and like even his lettering is different like his bubbles and his like his letters are different (laughs) yeah and i think i think that that like the fact that this he's clearly i mean i think he's not on (laughs) i don't think he's on the level i don't think that what he says is true or accurate but you can't dismiss what he's saying entirely right and he's clearly in contact with some power and i think that that makes a nice sort of just degree of uncertainty and i'm certainly willing to believe that he believes what he's saying and i'm certainly willing to believe that something like something is up even if it's not what he says so like you saying he feels like a character out of a different story i don't think is quite accurate but he does feel like he's he's like the end boss of a manga whereas like jen yeah. is someone you'd fight in volume two right so to see those two like mix it up you were talking mm-hmm. about earlier how like you go into that battle and you're like oh my god how is jen gonna get out of this and i kind of felt the same exact way honestly yes. of like this dude's just like trying to beat up ruffians and bring in bounties <laughs> and this is a literal demon samurai <laughs> yeah the, the, the next time jen and um jay meet which is like years later in the comic is i think i I think genuinely the most exciting bit like part of a comic that i've ever read because jen is approaching it in a very different with a very different sort of perspective and attitude having sort of gone through this uh but is still fundamentally just like a different character or like just from a different world um and i like i i think that that's the most sort of like nerve-wracking bit of a comic that i've ever read it's kind of like when a manga sidekick fights the main boss and you're like, you know you can, they can't win. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> that sort of thing. And I wonder, this might be a spoiler, so maybe don't tell me, but does the fact that Jay is in Azuma at that point factor into that fight? Because <laughs> Inazuma also does not like Jen. Yeah, and, and something that's been established in like years of comic before this point is that Inazuma is the absolute best swords person in the story, right? She she outclasses everybody else sort of quite easily. I, like Jen only escapes their first or like gets through their first fight through pure dumb luck. Yeah. And uh and, and so yeah, that that is an that's an added um I don't know, just sort of dimension to Jay going forward that they are suddenly uh, have access to, I don't know, the muscle memory of sort of the greatest swords. They're not only magic, seen. they're the best swords person in, in yeah. Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Nice. <laughs> So have we? Act- have any of us actually answered the question of whether he's evil or not? <laughs> whether they're I just, evil I, or not? I, well, it was about what makes them evil. And I think it's probably the things they do, which is kill everybody that they see <laughs> apart from one little well, girl. What if well, they my... all? Deser- what if they all deserve it though, Cal? My question, <laughs> my point is that everyone kills everyone. There's so much killing in this. Usagi kills lots of people. Jen kills lots of people. Yeah. Tomoe kills lots of people. Yeah, people are dying so... left and right. So why is the the deaths that? Jay cause why is that inherently evil when the other ones aren't it's because they're scared when they die is that evil I, th- I think the fact that he laughs as he sucks their souls out through his profaned spear is part of it 
yeah right. the enjoyment is maybe an aspect <laughs> but, but i think it's also just like the absolute lack of like provocational reason as well right like the the initial fight where he slaughters that that's a bunch of um uh like of, officials protecting their lords um uh, the only re- like the reason that he that he does that is because they like he perceives just the smallest slight and then you know slaughters what like must be sort of like 30 or, 30 or more people as a result of that um and i th- i think that distinguishes him from somebody like osagi who absolutely has a terrifying body count behind them but doesn't uh sort of proactively go out of their way to to attack um sort of sure and and, and kill people I think it's interesting they throw in the character Jen too, because he's a bounty hunter who kills for money. <laughs> but yeah. he is never once depicted as evil. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that's interesting. I think like get, he he's been on a journey in the comics at this at this point. Sure. Which which maybe which maybe helps distinguish that. But like I I think I think you're right, and I think that there is one of the things that I do like about the series as well is that there is like a bit of an ambivalence overall towards a lot of the societal structures that you know the characters inhabit i think you know when you meet sort of peasant characters occasionally they are you know they don't care if it's the shogun or the the emperor they're like well they're both you know like rubbish to us it doesn't mean anything um like our our lives mean nothing to them and i think that you do get a sense that you know the the system that everybody's caught up in whether it be uh sort of like Samurais, uh, their their lords, or or even sort of like bounty hunters, they're not nobody's sort of fully clean. I think so. I think that's a good observation, Pat. Sorry, I was, I was trying to remember why, why I started off down that road, but yes, okay. yeah, I think you ended at, you the... ended at a good spot. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> I think part of the difference, Pat, like expanding on that point too, is that Jen is operating within the systems that the society has created like jen is a bounty hunter but he only goes after people who have a bounty on their heads right like yes. whereas jay is an, a completely different system unto himself like he just sits in judgment based on whatever the gods or whoever depending yeah. on what we want to believe about him them it it i don't know <laughs> they tell, tell him um like so i think that's kind of why See, I don't actually, like, I don't know if I would go with Jay is evil as the assumption of my question. <laughs> well, I, it's an assumption because we're told repeatedly that he is. Hmm. By, by people who are looking at it from a perspective other than his. I think looking at it from Jay's perspective, the Jedi are evil. No, looking at <laughs> it from Jay's perspective, he's killing people the gods are telling him to kill. Mm-hmm. The fact that I, I think the thing that makes him evil to us as a reader more than anything is this like fixation he has with Usagi because like we know Usagi's legit <laughs> like we know Usagi's mm-hmm. a good guy or at least we think he is. Mm-hmm. Um, so for him to be so fixated on killing, so to me, Jay is very much like Venom, <laughs> like Spider Man's got- Venom. They have pointy teeth, so... Well, no, like, okay, so... <laughs> Scary and, face. <laughs> no, actually, like, in look and in, like, morals and outlook and, like, yeah. character dynamics, both of it. Like, you can see it, right, you guys? Yeah, like, no, no, I can't. Okay, because, like, I just, Venom... I just took a page with pointy teeth, so I, I just wanted to make that point quickly. No, so I, I agree. <laughs> so, like, so Venom's whole deal is, like, hates Spider-Man, otherwise wants to protect innocence. So, like, it's kind of the same of, like, hates Usagi, otherwise wants to protect innocence. And, like, I wonder if they're going to have their story soon where Jay figures out that Usagi's an innocent. (laughs) Because that happened to Spider-Man and Venom because turns out they wanted them to stop fighting so Venom could sell comic books and be in his own series. Does Jay ever possess Usagi? We've got to know right now. Does Usagi Um, get a black uniform? Yeah. So... Symbiote costume? Do you, yeah. do, you, do, you, do you want me to tell you? There is a future story where you explore what that would mean. I think that's oh. maybe the best, the best okay, way cool. that I can put that. Does he have um, cool, like, black samurai robes? I can't remember that off the top of my head. I remember. Oh, I remember, I remember, I remember like, I know. like it, it, is, it, is a, it is a cool, weird design for uh, a rabbit possessed <laughs> by that, that by, by Jay. Um, I, I think something that we should note as well whilst we're talking about Jay is the, the only reason that he's defeated at the end is because he is rushing to save um, the innocent girl. Uh, uh, K- uh, Kiko. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. he would have killed both of them otherwise. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. he would have absolutely just <laughs> gone through them like warm butter. Like I think um, each each time in the series to date where Asagi had uh, sort of like managed to get get away from Jay, it had almost entirely been luck each time, and that that extends to to this encounter as well. I think um, look 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 and you know him having the strength of will to be able to stab him with grass cutter. Uh, whilst it's like when there was an opening but yeah he wouldn't have had that were it not for jay having some degree of i don't know uh social conscience morality um, yeah yeah <laughs> I originally asked this question because from the actions of the characters in this volume because i haven't read anything else <laughs> jay's does jay's actions aren't more evil than he doesn't really stand else. out right like as like far there's as lots like... of death being dealt left and right and there are like, a couple instances where jay's is over the top and probably <laughs> unnecessary but mm-hmm. i mean at the end when he transfers to an mm-hmm. body and slaughters all the monks that's not great mm-hmm. it's not a good it's not great Oh yeah, yeah. He but does up, until <laughs> yeah. up until that point, up until that point, forgot about that one. But whatever no. Jay had done was, I would say his body count is probably less than our main protagonist, yeah. and at least like is internally consistent, right? Like, there's so many like backstabbings and betrayals throughout this story, mm-hmm. like from the prologues mm-hmm. on forward, and like. Mm-hmm. Jay's not gonna backstab or betray you. He will stab you in the face in the front, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So like. I had a problem with him being labeled evil. Yeah, he's got a scary face. He scares people. That doesn't make you evil. Okay? I cannot believe that you're going to try and rehabilitate. <laughs> Jason Voorhees is innocent. Yeah. Innocent. Um, but no, I mean, but I, th- I think that, yeah, there is absolutely meant to be that degree of just uh, slight uncertainty about how you're meant to feel about him. I mean, I think you're meant to feel scared of him, without a doubt. Um, and he's constantly targeting people that we like, but there is, uh, I think I think you should always feel, and I think the book intends you to feel on slightly unsteady ground if you're trying to make any really straight declarative statement about Jay, because there's just something twisty and weird about every everything that he does that just um, resists that sort of like really linear interpretation i think yeah i think that look look on usagi's face at the end where he's talking about like where is the body so <laughs> a lot of how we're supposed to feel about jay yeah yeah i'm very like this is definitely a book where i'm gonna go pick up other volumes at some point because like i've been meaning to anyways and this was just a good prompt to finally get into it um and that's one of the things that i'm most interested in reading more about and i'm glad that jay actually only pops up every once in a while because like mm. I think the problem with that sort of character, like, again, EG Venom, is, like, if they start <laughs> popping up too much, you lose a lot yes. of that unsteadiness around them. Like, you start to figure out what their deal is, or, like, mm-hmm. you start to not become as uncomfortable seeing or watching them. So mm-hmm. it's pretty heartening to hear that Jay only shows up every once in a while, and that one of the times is just, like, a murder fest <laughs> through, yeah. like, every single main character in the book, because that feels appropriate for the character. Yeah. Th- 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 there's... And I think this is this is something that's quite interesting in this book as well, because ordinarily you've got uh, throughout the series, um, as I, I think as I was saying earlier, Asagi is just paired up with like one of his supporting cast, maybe two at the very, very most, but usually just like one or two at a time. And because we've got, a, you know, a reasonably high degree of confidence that he's going to make it through a story because his name is on is on the book. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, I, I think the more of it you read, you just get a, a degree of faith in his competence in any given situation. And so it's very rare that you feel worried about another character when they're with Asagi. Um, and I think that's something that's that's fun about this book is that you see like he, most of the support and cast are separate from him for the majority of the story. Uh, I think it's only really uh, again that he spends that time with. Um, but but like yeah, in in the future story. Basically, Asagi is tied up with other stuff, and he and Jay is just sort of working his way, uh, int- intentionally or not, through the supporting cast when they're separated from Asagi. And it's just, oh, I don't know, it's just, it's such an exciting, tense uh, story where it feels like all bets are off. Um, I like it a lot. It feels like it would be another another crossover level event style of excitement. 
<laughs> yeah, and it's just oh, I, the, the the stuff with like the format, and I think you know, I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff to say just about like the craft of this book as well. But like, I think I mean, in the in this future book, it's got some of the the most sort of like exciting kind of like fight scenes that I've seen. But I think you get that in this one as well. Like the you know like when you get to the the final kind of confrontation with Jay, like everything is opening up to these like big panels that really sell the I don't know, just like the intensity and the significance of what it means for Usagi and Jay to be to be fighting. And I think, you know, yeah, by the time that you get to that final splash panel of sort of weird ghosts exploding from Jay's body after he's been stabbed, like, it, I, like just from, from like a craft point of view, I think it's just, it's really good at selling the, I don't know, the, the significance of having been able to even sort of temporarily uh, defeat him. Yeah, I think the final pages of that fight are definitely some of the best fight scene pages in the book especially because you can tell usagi's like really messed up like one of his eyes is just like mm. bruised over closed like his other <laughs> eye he's just like is also black end it looks like they're charging <laughs> at each other and then you kind of know it's serious when the pages start going to less and less panels because there are a lot <laughs> of panels on most pages in this book <laughs> so for the the story to kind of like slow down and hit those moments and then yeah that final splash page of jay just yelling and like something clearly like <laughs> extra normal happening <laughs> like yes. paranormal yeah i think we're on our final question now which is one of yours cal <laughs> hmm. oh yeah. yeah yeah okay cool i'm looking at it right now um uh, so uh, something that i've spoken about quite a lot i think through this conversation is one of the things that like i i really respond to from from the series and i think one of the things that if you're reading in sequence makes this story in particular just really special and memorable is the fact that this comic is one big continuous thing by exactly the same creator who has just managed to <laughs> managed to just like find what he wants to do and he can do it well and he's just done it now for yeah sort of like approaching 40 years um and uh um, I, th I, th I think that that's quite unusual in in western comics um, in, in particular, but like I was just wondering if if there were if there were other series that that you two have enjoyed that have a similar kind of feeling where you do just get to stay with creators and you know their work and they they really get to like see things through and like plant seeds or just really perfect their their take on on something. So um, yeah, are there any sort of comparable things that 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 uh, you've enjoyed um, on that basis? Yeah, so I was thinking about it, and like the first one that jumped to mind, just because of like it's one of the longer actual superhero runs that exist now, because superhero runs don't get to go more than like twelve issues these days, right? Like, um, was Ultimate Spider-Man, which went for forever, but like, as far as does the quality hold up throughout that whole thing in the same way Usagi does, it definitely doesn't. Like, there's a <laughs> whole middle section of Ultimate Spider-Man where it just kind of like feels stale. So I don't think that even kind of gets in the same bracket. Although, like, the first... I'm kind of looking at it on my shelf now. The first, like, 10 to 12 volumes are good. Drops off for about 8. And then the back half into, spoilers, The Death of Ultimate Peter Parker, <laughs> also good. Although they, they, the creative team changes then as well, right? Like, isn't that when it you It does lose... a little bit, yeah. So it's not um... Mark Bagley on art once it <laughs> goes to the second volume. Oh, no, actually, he drops off. I think even in the first volume, now that I'm thinking about it. So yeah, it isn't even the same creative team throughout. <laughs> so it doesn't even qualify. It doesn't meet the criteria of the question. Um, <laughs> well, thank you, Matt. <laughs> well, that was your first one. Okay. What's your second one? So, what, so that one's out, basically. <laughs> like, I, just to walk you through my thought process here, is like, that one oh. was close, but no. So the second one I thought of, actually, was Calvin and Hobbes, which I think does qualify. That was the one that I was immediately... Drawn to is like that's kind of what I thought you would answer too, Pat. Is like that's super interesting because it's not the same thing where there's ever really like a long form story, right? Like there's no Calvin and Hobbes grass cutter. Although now I really want <laughs> there, there, are, to there are like references to earlier things, but yeah, it's not. Yeah, stuff plays in here and there, but like it's it's not the same thing. But like as far as craft quality and like artistic vision throughout, like. Those are all like the same. Like the for the last Calvin and Hobbes strip, one of the best Calvin and Hobbes strips. So like, um, so I think Calvin and Hobbes is a good answer. And then before I let you expand on that, Pat, the other one that came to mind for me was Bone because I think that's like an eleven-year run. Um, mm -hmm. Also, Bone was going to be comic. my recommendation if you're going to do recommendations. Oh like... shit! 
Pat's <laughs> doing all your stuff. He's just stealing everything from me. I'm just going to sit here. I mean, I've only read Bone like the one time, so I think I'll just let you expand on it at this point, Pat. You can talk about Bone and Kevin. Oh, no, I mean, like obviously, here. Bone doesn't have the four prologues that are talking to it. I mean, I would say it's comparable in uh illustration right matt like the the cartooniness Mm -hmm. that it conveys serious events is similar yeah so actually like all three of those like those series that we're talking around here are like the same level of like cartooniness to different degrees Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. Yojimbo has much more like shading and work on the page a lot of the times although those kelvin and hobbs where he's like a private detective or there are dinosaurs and stuff like (laughs) those are actually quite complicated and like not they're still very clean but they're a very different style than the normal calvin and Hobbes strips so yeah no i would like we never addressed it we referenced them slightly but the dinosaurs in this remind me a whole mm. lot of bones mm. <laughs> the rat creatures and bones yeah, yeah. to those dinosaurs i can see a direct like oh hey look similar huh. and That's bones similar to me in that there are not like one-off stories but there are side stories but it's all within like mm. the larger overarching plot of the series which is a big fantasy nonsense thing yes <laughs> but at the same time phony bones running gambling stuff out of a bar and like, <laughs> that's really cool <laughs> so it totally makes sense to me that that would be your like your follow-up suggestion pat yeah that that's definitely got a lot of parallels i think the, the thing that that felt most similar within comics to me was um i don't know if either of you've read uh love and rockets um by the Hernandez twins, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's been running. I'm not sure if they're twins. Um it's been running for let's see, um just as I literally forever. Oh yeah, like it must be like forty must be forty years or so. Yeah, I was gonna Uh, say thirty, forty might be right. Yeah. Um let's see. Oh, actually, tell you what, less I mean still still a long time, but like thirty years. So nineteen eighty two it started. (laughs) And like it's just but like it, like they just like keep keep doing them, and they're really good. And you just sort of check in with the characters, like as it goes. So like it's got a similar feeling, I think, of there's just a world that continues, and people keep living in it, and stuff is always happening. And you just sort of check in with them every now and again. It's just like the creators doing what they find interesting, uh, like as a result of that. And so you get to see them develop as artists, but also you know their interests and their priorities shift as well like you absolutely see that with uh usagi yojimbo as well i I think like they're very different feeling comics uh overall but that was the that was the closest i could think of where you've just had that consistency and then you get this sort of i don't know uh meta level of interest and uh and for me enjoyment of just being able to just see something being refined and improved continuously over that period as well um that, yeah that, that was the closest that i could feel although yeah, like i say they are very very different uh kinds of comics uh, at the same time no the only other thing i was thinking of is that interestingly the other uh comparison i could make to comic books is the other manga series that are are long running yeah like the ones that i've read in like dragon ball z like even yep. sailor moon I mean, One Piece, these things have been going on forever, and who knows? Yeah. Just go on until, one, you know, the end of time. One, one Piece is actually the, the thing that I was going to recommend in the... Uh, yeah. In, in the I get to steal so, other people's things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but because I think, yeah, I, th- I think that there is something similar. I think that this, it just, like, it blows, like, I'm, I'm massively grateful for it, but it, it blows my mind that... Sagio Jumbo has had the number of comics published that it has consistently over, yeah, just sort of like, yeah, multiple decades at this point. Because I feel like you, like sometimes you see that with, with manga, but but even then they've got like whole creative teams, right, that are working. That's because there's different publication right, schedules. No, Sakai is on another level, the fact that he is. Yeah. Like yeah. But like, yeah, it's sort of like some of those long running mangas do feel like the same kind, like th- th- that feel that felt like one of the closest things that I could, that I could think of, I think. So having said it's unparalleled, what are our recommendations to people who like this book and want to read other uh, books or experience other media things? <laughs> We've uh, kind of already said them, but let's go yeah, through Bones them. Bones is, I think, what you and I would say for one, correct? Mm-hmm. It wasn't actually going to be my recommendation, but I think oh, it, well, it, right. it is a I good say, recommendation. I will stand alone on Bones. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then also the video game I talked about earlier, Kami. I think if you oh, yeah, enjoy yeah. the Japanese folklore... And you want to experience it in a different medium, um, 
Mikami is a great video game. It's available, I think, on almost everything. Mm. There was a remake recently, so it's even more gorgeous. You play Amaterasu as a white wolf, and you get to paint like designs to cast spells. It's really great. It's an oh, awesome I remember game. seeing ads for that one back in the day, actually. It's Not really good. Either. I would uh, highly recommend yeah, it. I love that game. It's a good <laughs> recommendation. Um, I think... For me, so th- there's a couple of things that I thought. So um, I, I, th- I mentioned earlier, I think One Piece is like a weirdly comparable thing oh, that I've read. So that's that's the limitation on it. But like it, it, it's it's something that you just get the sense of like this is one person uh, with a supporting team. But like it, it's absolutely the vision of one person doing something very specific and getting you know sort of like a decade plus in which to do that, or like uh, two decades plus, I think uh, for. Um, just about for for one piece so I, that that was that was one thing i think the other thing that i was well, the other two things i was going to recommend one of them is uh hellboy uh which um is similarly one of my absolute favorite series but uh i think hellboy on a uh like uh is is closer to what an ordinary issue of usagi Jumbo feels like where that had a lot of just sort of like done in one sort of single issues uh, that would tell a complete story of the main character just wandering into a different situation, there being a weird mixture of politics and supernatural things, and then sort of you know having to figure out how to get out of it. Um, so I think it, that that the core of that is absolutely present in Hellboy and Asagi like Jumbo. Do you have any the... specific runs of Hellboy you would recommend? <laughs> Yeah, weirdly, <laughs> maybe this is actually similar to uh, <laughs> me recommending Grass Cutter as this, this entry point. <laughs> but I think Hellboy in Hell uh, is probably the strongest uh, like run of stories in Hellboy. Oh boy, Hellboy, though, is... as someone who has read the first volume of Hellboy in Hell and has read bits and pieces of other Hellboy stuff besides that, like I don't think I would jump you into Hellboy. In <laughs> Hell. <laughs> you, you must, you must, you mustn't cuddle. You mustn't cuddle people. Uh, no, it's oh, it, the... so. I think it's like the third <laughs> volume of Hellboy. I feel like it really finds its footing. Hang on. Now yeah, the, the, the Wild Hunt. If you're talking about the omnibus. Yeah, I think so. Yes. Yeah, and um, yeah, that that is that that that's a very good uh, like that that is exceptional as well. Um, Honestly, just start with pancakes. If you read pancakes yes, and yeah. you like it, then you'll like yeah, yeah, Hellboy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's two oh. pages. <laughs> Put it in the show notes, Matt. It's available online. Damn you! The, the only other series that I was going to recommend as well is another manga uh, called uh, Mushishi. I don't know, have either of you uh, come across that one before? Yeah, I think so. Isn't there an anime? There is, yeah, which I've only seen it's a couple the, of episodes the, of, but I, like, I liked I liked what the I saw. Kami's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the anime, so I'm sure the manga is also equally... Yeah. It, it was. It's a really direct adaptation, which is, I think, why I didn't stick with the anime, because I was like, oh, I know. I, I know every I've seen this. Beat of this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but it's it's got it's a really thing. touching. Yeah. Oh, it's really nice, isn't it? It's just um, yeah, just like very quiet little stories of somebody wandering around, um, sort of Japan in the past, solving different sort of spiritual, uh, I don't know, sort of mysteries um, in like each new town that they go to, which again feels very Asagi Ojembo, I think. Um, so yeah, that that was the, th- those are the three things that I was going to recommend. Um, yeah, uh, Matt, have you done? Have you done yours? No, I haven't. I would recommend the direct sequel to this story, uh, Veroni Kenshin. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually heard that the the creator behind Kenshin may or may not be problematic. Like I've heard yes. whisperings of that on Twitter. Yes. So I guess yes. watch out for that. Um, <laughs> I'm not surprised, given that series depiction of women sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. Like, but that also kind of feels true to me as a whole for manga sometimes anyways disregarding some of that stuff um the stuff that really makes me think of it is like kenshin is a wandering samurai in the same way that usagi is um he ends up meeting up with a bunch of side characters there's so much politics stuff in kenshin because kenshin was an assassin during the meiji period or no the um just before meiji the civil war that the whole thing is about anyways I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. <laughs> show notes exist. Yeah. Oh, we did it. Yeah. Um, so Kenshin's a former assassin from the Civil War period before the Emperor is restored to power, because eventually that happens, apparently. Um, and then from there, he's kind of falling. He's like trying to balance not falling back into his former life as an assassin with having to take care of responsibilities that he has from that time period and like his. Yeah, talk um, about the reverse blade. The reverse blade. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't actually kill people unless he flips his blade around because he's got a reverse blade. 
So uh, I forgot about that. Yeah, so he mostly just bludgeons people to the point where they would have it's probably better. died. It's Let's better. Be <laughs> if you get a battering in the shoulder, you're not yeah. going to die. He just cripples people. It's better. It's Don't. Fine. It's fine. But that book runs for um for 28 volumes and like there's a big thing in the middle of it that's very much like an action politics thriller sort of in the same vein of grass cutter where it pulls together multiple threads and then the very back half of it is more of like a like a personal story where um there's a figure who's like trying to like break Kenshin's spirit essentially and prove that he can't be a good person um it's very batman r.i.p actually cal <laughs> if that makes sense to you Ooh. Um, yeah okay okay all um, right <laughs> I do, maybe i, I will do really that. like that series again the author or like the creator may or may not be problematic. I don't know. I've been kind of staying away from that because I like the I've series heard, a lot I've and I don't want to ruin it for myself. Okay, all right. I won't, I won't tell you what's heard then. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> um, So with with caveats, that's my recommendation. Cool. I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but I would say Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It is Chinese, not Japanese, but I got similar mm. feels of warriors, traditional culture, seeped yeah. in history and everyone fighting over a magical sh- sword magical sword yeah ah, that is very good i love That's that a very good so much yeah yeah all right but i think that is going to do it for this month's discussion of usagi yojimbo grass cutter as always if you want to get in touch with pat or myself you can find us on twitter is at what podcast you can email us at waiting on the trade at gmail.com and you can find even more stuff at mattreadscomics.com We would also love if you would leave a review of the podcast on your podcasting app of choice. Five stars is great. Honest reviews are fine too, I guess. (laughs) No, no. Five stars is honest. What are you talking about? Come on. (laughs) Uh, Cal, do you want to be found online? And if so, where? Uh, No, do do not at me. Yeah, I kind of figured. (laughs) (laughs) If you want to at Cal, you could at at us and I will provide the message to him. (laughs) Cal, really appreciate you coming on and always picking great books. Every time. I really enjoyed that. And always like doing enough research that I feel comfortable not having to do my own. <laughs> it makes it easier. <laughs> it's like honestly, it's a big part of what I enjoy uh, about this as well. I think I, I, like it's nice just to have a reason to think about something that I've just sort of like inhaled at some point, and then I don't know. Yeah, it's just it's it's nice to have to actually articulate why it why something means so much to me. Uh, like I really like that. So uh, I'm I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity to come on. That's really kind of you. Well, there will be more. Um, but next month, we have a treat for everyone as we start an epic crossover with uh, the folks of the SJW Comic Book Club podcast. So the first part of that crossover will be next month's episode. But we will see you then. Bye.